you know, in many of you have been on this uh, call before, so uh, and uh, it's wonderful to see uh, everybody come back. And if you're new here, just remind you that you know each every Tuesday we decided we'd get together at four o'clock. We decided this in March when we went remote, just to remind ourselves that we were a community, we're a community of faculty and uh, and uh, students, and also you know because we're the Merrick School of Business, we're very embedded with our business partners, and so we see ourselves as a community. Uh, and and we decided we'd keep these business, these meetings going in the in the fall semester, but be a focused community and a community with purpose where we're really looking at, you know, what is the shape of business in the post COVID, uh, COVID-19 world? And we've been inviting guests. Uh, uh, I think we've had eight uh, guests uh, uh, up to date uh, and, and, and really having a discussion about their business, what they went, have been going through, but also how they see things uh, uh, shaped really important uh, it's always important for our students i mean our students are here because they're uh they're they're shaping their careers uh, some of them are launching careers some of them are launching new careers and so want to understand a little bit about this world that they're they're going into uh and our faculty is very important for us uh, we're working with our our business partners at at, at reshaping our, our, our curriculum. That's, that's our number one priority uh, this year is to, is to reshape our curriculum. We wanna make sure that we're really relevant uh, for, a, uh, for the post COVID world, for whatever world is, is, is emerging. I think it's important for everybody, faculty, students, uh, uh, business colleagues and partners here as well, because I've, as I said before, there's a tendency in these topics for us to believe that we are sort of passive, that this is happening to us. And I really believe that we've had an opportunity to, to shape things ourselves. You know, we're not passive actors in this. We can be active in shaping it. And to do that, we've got to understand things better. And so that's why we've got this guest. Today, I'm really guest. So really, today, I'm really pleased that we our guest is a John a. Richards, uh, who is a, the, uh, John Richard, who is the Global Vice President, General Manager of DuPont Safety. Uh, some of the brands that uh, John uh, manages uh, in a, uh, almost a $3 billion a business, uh, Kevlar, you, I think all of you would be familiar with Kevlar. Some of you, um, particularly who have uh, being first responders and no first responders, be familiar with Nomax, uh, Tyvek. Uh, those are your, you know, put, it got lots of applications, but we have a big program in real estate and, and lot our, uh, uh, you'll see Tyvek in a lot of our buildings uh, and Typar, uh, another uh, high performance uh, uh, material. Uh, he's been in that role uh, since 2000 and March, uh, 2017, a long career in DuPont. Uh, and uh, before that, was in a, uh, a number of businesses, managed other uh, uh, great businesses with some great brands. Uh, one of my favorites is Corian, uh, that, uh, and that in itself is a great story that we could spend an hour on, on John, uh, uh, how to turn, turn that around. Uh, John has a, a BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Delaware. He's got a, also an MS in mechanical engineer from Virginia Tech. An MBA from uh, Columbia Business School, uh, which, by the way, John, I did explain last week uh, when we were when I was announcing you that explained that not everybody could get into University of Baltimore. So, but we're we're <laughs> we're, we're we're pleased that we've you've, you've got an MBA uh, from from Columbia. And uh, John is passionate also about growing businesses. He helps to advise other emerging businesses. Uh, He's got a very balanced set of activities he does around the, with his family and keeps fit. And so, uh, John, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful to have you. So thank you. And the way, just a format for this, just to remind you, John, I'm going to speak for about 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to break into small groups again. And uh, you devise some questions to, to ask. Uh, and then we'll spend the last uh, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes or so, you know, as answering your your questions, and uh, I have to say, by the way, and just as a, a preface to this, I, I spent uh, quite a bit of time getting to know John because there's, you know, John is, uh, you know, from a from a learning point and for a teaching point around international business. Um, 
John is both one, by the way, a wonderful teacher and, uh, but he's also got great experience. And so I've spent a lot of time, you know, trying to understand these business. And so there's a lot of great stories there. John, I really want to take, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know, 2017, you took over this business. It was, you pulled, you were asked to pull together some quite well-known brands within the DuPont family, you know, as part of this new uh, new entity as a result of the Dow DuPont uh, merger. They're, a, uh, they're uh, you're asked to pull this together. I think you were given 18 months to pull it together. And uh, at the end of 2018, you had shaped this business. And I kind of like to, to start there. So everybody's on a sort of even playing field about what is the shape of the business? You know, what, what is the shape of the businesses, the products, how your and your strategies as you were emerging out of 2018, having turned around the business, you know, you're, you're a, that's a great story, but you're, you've got a business here in 2018 and you've got a new strategy and you're really going just, you know, sort of explain to everybody, what is that business? Cause that is, I guess, that's where we're going to start uh, today and then think about what happens in the pandemic. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Murray. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you're at. Uh, sorry, I was a few minutes late. Um, it, it really wasn't the Zoom call. It was the commute. And I don't know about you, but my commute was an extra 20 feet to get into the office. Just kidding. Um, but nonetheless, glad to be here this evening. Murray, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, let's talk uh, for a moment about very quickly 2017 and into 2018 uh, before we formed uh, the safety business in 2019 and bringing us up to today. The, um, you know, the set of circumstances I shared with Murray back in 2017 was that um, at the time in DuPont, we had two businesses that are premier brands, Kevlar and Nomex, uh, and they're roughly about the same size. The two, the two of those businesses together are about a billion and a half dollars. And uh, the circumstances we faced were um, several fold. We had one business that was hemorrhaging cash uh, on a quarter to quarter basis. Uh, and we had another that was financially healthy, but not growing. In fact, both businesses were shrinking at about 2% a year for uh, about a three to four year period. So clearly uh, <clears throat> not a tenable situation. And uh, based on my background and experience, uh, they'd asked me to come in and try to orchestrate a turnaround, which was far more attractive than to spin the businesses out uh, into uh, private equity or elsewhere. So, um, you know, the team uh, that I, the first fundamental challenge that we faced was simply put, these two businesses were similar in terms of the technology or the chemistry, uh, but they were being run completely independently, not only independently on a global basis, but they were being run regionally. And so you can imagine two businesses, four primary regions around the world. So that's eight, <clears throat> eight operating and leadership teams trying to make strategic decisions on the behalf of two, or in this case now, one going concern. So up front, there was a need to rebuild the operating model and the managing processes that we were running so that we could make decisions on a much more um, fast basis that uh, would allow us to start to right size the ship. The businesses are also suffering um, a crisis of confidence. The organization was not uh, needed more intelligence and understanding around the current set of circumstances. And so there was immediately a expectation that I put in around a higher degree of transparency, the good, the bad, and the ugly that needed to be communicated about our circumstance. That was the only way we were going to galvanize and rally the, the 1,500 or so folks in the organization. And then the last element um, that really was a fundamental issue was structural. And we had to do a fair amount of root cause analysis to really get at what was causing you know, the decline in the businesses year over year. And it came down to a couple primary factors. One was we were not playing to win. We were striving to avoid losing. And so really all of our actions were risk averse, whether it was in our strategies for growth or the tactical decisions we were making. 
It was all about avoiding the downside and not taking the risk to take advantage of the upside. But the proof was in the, the demonstration of results over the prior four year period. The second fundamental issue we faced was um, we ultimately had a structural challenge in the market that we were participating in. And uh, the, the backdrop very quickly was simply that we had built a very large manufacturing facility a new to the world, state of the art, most expensive, largest uh, operating facility. But it was so large and it was ill-timed that we were indirectly fueling our own demise because we were trying to fill the volume at the expense of profitability. And so when I arrived in 2017, a third of all of our product sales were negative gross margin. You're all in business, so you understand that's not a good situation to be in. So uh, long story short, we did some strategic analysis and we created a thesis that if we were to actually shut down our largest, newest facility and reconsolidate into our older facilities, our sales to capacity ratio would increase, our competitor's sales to capacity ratio would increase, we would not go chase volume at the expense of price and profitability, and in turn, over time, the overall industry would return to health, and then that would fuel a virtuous upward cycle of continuous investment. So in 17 and 18, that turnaround took place. That allowed us to now invest in technologies that will be coming to the world next year and have a profound impact, just like the original Kevlar and Nomex products did. Um, but all told, those actions over that two-year period were able to almost double the EBITDA of the business um, and added roughly $300 million to, to the overall portfolio. So a significant change of events. In 2019, um, it takes us to today as a setup for the conversation. The 2017 and 18 period were primarily a technology and product push to the market. It was not fundamentally a market back approach. And so the calculus and the, the theory that I put forward to my board of directors and leadership was to form an umbrella organization called DuPont Safety. And fold in, in addition to Kevlar and Nomex, add in our Tyvek and our Typhar businesses. One, it would uh, allow us to demonstrate who we were in the essence of what we do, which was we protect those that protect us. Our innovations are all around material-based uh, products. So fibers, papers, pulp, and other forms, but they have unique characteristics that enable everything from first responders to airplanes to the defense and the military to operate. So the safety business was formed and we took a market back approach with a balance towards asset forward. So we reiterated on the operating model and the managing processes. We created a personal protection platform that has the scale of some of our near competitors like 3M and Honeywell. And then we started to move forward with implementing that model in 2019. Great results. We ended 2019 with all the momentum we had anticipated for the business of our size. We're hitting all of our targets. And then COVID hits. And Murray, I'll stop there and see if you want me to lead into 2019 or turn it back to you. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I, you know, that's perfect. Maybe just to get a sort of shape, you've got now, you've got sort of four product lines, but, and you're organized with one single team now. And, uh, um, and your strategy is focused on, on what industries, you know, the, just so sort of just, sure. then, then I'll ask you a question about 2019 and COVID. Yeah. What industries are you focused on? Yeah, so a couple of points there. Um, you hit on a really good one. Each time we've had to consolidate a business, you know, you end up and you're going to find in your careers and you likely have it in the businesses you work with today. You know, our business is differentiated, truly not on the technology any longer. It's on the people. And we have some incredibly good people in DuPont. The challenge I had as a leader was how do you consolidate leadership teams without disenfranchising or alienating some of your top talent? Because not everyone is going to be at a leadership team level. And so we did several things, but one of the things that we did was we ended up setting up advisory councils on a regional basis. And because our leadership team couldn't parallel process 
every circumstance we were facing, we parsed out some of the needs that we had to these advisory councils, which are comprised of many of those leaders in all of the businesses in different functions and at different levels. And they help us process the challenges that we face at a core leadership team level. But the main, uh, we have eight industrial segments that we serve. Um, I'll start with the first one, and that is calling, you know, defining and calling ourselves as we were. We had a good portion of our portfolio that truly was commodity. And commodity, I mean, there were no long-term contracts. It was spot pricing, easily substituted. And we got real clear that there was roughly a quarter of our portfolio that's commodity. We called it out, we carved it out, we run it very differently than the rest of our business. It's run purely on a rules-based basis, maximize profitability or we exit the spaces we're in. The other seven market segments are ones that we define from the industry back that you'll know well, aerospace, healthcare, defense, personal protection, uh, electrical infrastructure, automotive, so healthcare. So those end up now in this new format having critical mass. And that was one of the things we lacked when we had a product forward approach or an asset forward approach. The market back allowed us to group multiple products based on the industries we were serving. And with critical mass comes being a leader, a chosen leader as number one or number two in each of those spaces that we play in. And so now the scale of each of those end use markets are anywhere from a couple hundred million dollars to over a billion dollars. And that really constitutes the core of our safety business today. So thanks. And so COVID hits and you know, you've had this momentum, you're going COVID hits, what happens to the business? <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's a great question. And I can tell you as a business leader, it's probably been the preeminent challenge of my career. Uh, I feel grateful I've gone through a number of cycles uh, to get to this point. But ultimately, because part of a large portion of the safety business is built on responding to natural disasters uh, or epidemics that take place around the world. We have a business built on reacting to crises. So back in December of last year, we already had some visibility of how bad this was going to be because of our team in China. So we respond to MERS and SARS and avian flu quite easily and regularly. Uh, we respond to Fukushima as an example. December of last year gave us a lot more pause. Um, we did not in the Western hemisphere really appreciate what people were going through in China at the time. Uh, but when January came around in February, and I won't play out the whole timeline, we all know here in the US, it really hit us in spades in March. Um, it was pretty bad. And it was a dual fold problem that uh, the safety business faced. One, we needed to respond different bigger and better than and faster than we had ever had to in any other epidemic type response. And the second was, we all know this, the industrial part of our economy came to a screeching halt. And so if you flip the lens on the safety business and go back to the assets, we had three of the four lines of business, Kevlar and Nomex in particular, where volumes disappeared to the point it dropped probably 35%. And you all know about break-even points. And so very quickly on these large intensive asset businesses, you can go underwater. But on the flip side, we had we could not make enough pounds of material. We still can't today to respond to the pandemic as well as some of the other demands that are in our Tyvek business. So we had a very bifurcated business that was happening over the last nine months. And it truly has been, um, a tale of two extremes, taxing the, the leadership team and our entire organization on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what, what were some of the things that you, because you're not, I think just to get people clear, your supply chain, your, your manufacturing plants are in different places in the world. Is that right? Including Southern China, is that correct? And, yeah, so and that's right, Murray. So very, very easily to frame this out. In each one of those eight industrial segments we play in, we have a different value chain and we have a different place in the value chain. 
But if I focus on the one segment, our largest, our personal protection segment, that's the one that was and still is part and parcel to the pandemic response. We built that model to drive the lowest cost possible in our converting operations. So we were looking to maximize earnings, not respond quickly to a large scale global pandemic and so as, or run it for cash. And so as a result, you know, we faced having a distributed converting network around the world, but typically in the lower cost countries of the world. But that meant in order to, to maximize our earnings, you know, we had product on the water, a lot of working capital tied up on the value chain, taking three, four, five months on a boat to get to a part of the world, but then come back in a finished garment. And that clearly was not a model that was going to work in response to the pandemic uh, around the world. And, and so where I, I, I'm going to ask you, there's a couple other issues in the supply chain, but immediately, I mean, what, what were some of the things that you immediately had to do, you know, to, you know, to, to adapt to that supply chain, particularly to, to. Yeah, there was, so there's, and, and normally in these circumstances, right, you all know there's, there's no one silver bullet. Um, there's a multitude of approaches that need to be taken. And so what we did was we, we came at the problem from the standpoint of let's one, set up a set of principles on how we're gonna manage the, the instantaneous infinite amount of demand that was coming our way. Two, um, how would we change how we offer products to the market to be more flexible and to allow, again, in the spirit of the greatest, fastest response possible. And so in a normal time, I'll give you a couple examples. In a normal time, we would convert our roll stock into garments and we sell the garments. We depleted and we continued to sell as many garments as we could through our normal channels, but we preferentially supplied our customers that had oversized exposure to the healthcare arena. The next thing we did was we actually, instead of converting the product ourselves, we converted, we gave those roll goods to the fashion industry uh, that were converting product that they had idle assets because no one's buying clothes. So we provided the instructions, the actual details needed. And it is quite sophisticated to make a garment that will protect you from you know, bacteria or viruses, provided the instructions and the roll good so that they could then take advantage of idle capacity in a part of the in a sector that we never would participate in with our product. And then we also negotiated ways to shorten our overall supply chain because today we would take product, put it on a rail car, a rail car would go to a boat, boat would go around the world and then come back. And so we negotiated getting roll stock right out of our facility, flown on 747s directly over to our low cost manufacturing facility and then brought back uh, and do a weekly turn so that we could land product where it was needed as fast as possible. And then over the longer term, we could see the optics of the disruption this causes. You know, there's nothing like a pandemic to drive, you know, interest in making sure you're protecting your, your populations. And so we saw rules go up in Europe around product being, product flows being uh, limited. We saw rules start to go up in the US. You know, similar things are happening in Asia. And so it was very clear that one of the outcomes of this is going to be near shoring, more near shoring or onshoring of, of activity. And so we have a pretty fungible contract manufacturing base. And so now we've started to reestablish operations closer to the US, in this case, Mexico, be more costly, but it'll be shorter supply chain and we'll be able to get product to market faster calculated bet that likely will pay out, unfortunately, as the pandemic continues to, to go in the wrong direction here in North America, at least. And, you know, I mean, this, there, there's a lot of questions around, you know, what's happening in supply chains. And I want to give the groups a, um, some time to, to process and come back, because there's also a lot of, you got, just want to, you know, remember the scale here of this change, you got nearly 4,000 people right in your organization. So, I mean, I, at some point, maybe after we come back, we should talk about just how do you both motivate and mobilize 4,000 people, you know, when there's this amount of um, uh, disruption. 
Um, but one, you know, one question that some people have been asking about supply chains in this, in this world, and we go to the post-COVID world, is you, know, you, you institute a new business model here where you're supplying, you know, this, this is fashion, fashion houses. But is that a temporary, is that just a temporary move and everything will stabilize? Or is that move in your business model something that you see as more permanent? So, you know, ultimately for long-term value to be created, there needs to be two parties. And I think to the extent we have a compelling value proposition to the fashion houses um, and to the extent they have an interest, then I think there's a long-term opportunity here. You know, we initially went in focused on it for the acute short-term need. And that was the primary reason continues to be, it may be the only reason. Uh, but it has opened up an avenue and adjacency that in normal circumstances, we probably would not be operating in or participating in. The pandemic, to our benefit, has, I think, increased the exposure and understanding level of many people outside of our normal industrial segments of what, for instance, Tyvek is. And so we are actively thinking through how we might be able to parlay that into a more sustained presence in the healthcare arena. There's a lot of regulation standards, approvals required, but ultimately there is a toehold now that that could result in a longer term relationship with different value chains than we have set up uh, on a legacy basis. That's great. I got tons of still tons of questions, but I may what I like to do is, is give people a chance to ask you questions. The way I think the best way to do this, we, we break people into to groups is random. Uh, I explain this every week, uh, you know, so if you're a student and you end up with a faculty member, you've got equal waiting to that faculty member. There's no assessments here. Um, and uh, faculty members likewise. And, uh, and, you know, John, I'll put you into a group as well. Uh, we'll go, we'll go for just about 12, 15 minutes. And then, you know, so what I, you know, what I want you to discuss in the, in, in the, um, uh, in your in your breakout groups is some more questions to ask John about here's a, a large global business operating in, in different uh, in different countries uh, able and half of the business or more than half of the business to respond to the other half of the business temporarily at least devastated uh, uh, clearly having to do some radical things in the business model the questions you have that uh, that John that we can dig in with John when you when you come back, and I'm going to break this into, um, I think, um, I think this, I want to get about, um, yeah, it'd be probably four to five people in a breakout group. John, you'll probably go into a breakout group yourself. Uh, you're welcome to stay in that group, or if you want to move around, you know, you can come back and I can try and move you again. Okay. Right. So that sounds good. All right. Here we go. All right. Hey, you were back, come back, good. All right, you're back, John. Good. All right, I think we're we're ready. We got slightly less than we started with, but maybe there's a breakout group that decided to find a way of not getting back. So, uh, so um, you can post your uh, questions, um, uh, and and I'll start actually with a uh, first one from. And, and by the way, uh, John, I should say when I'm doing this, uh, Danielle Giles, who's here, she's my. She's our marketing uh, director and uh, she keeps track of the chats as well. So she, I, I ask her sometimes to, to you know, come in so we can keep this going in a freely flow. But the first one I'm going to start with, with uh, Frank K. Feffler, who, uh, uh, Pfeiffer, sorry. Uh, so how do you perceive manufacturing in the United States and what dynamic would it take for you to consider manufacturing I, here, I mean, I guess you do manufacture here, so you might want to explain that to Frank, but I guess 
do more manufacturing here? Um, what, what kind of other particular packages or incentives that would would make it more attractive to do more manufacturing here? And yeah, so great question. I'll try to answer these pretty quickly so we can move through as many questions as possible. So we have a global footprint on how we uh, manufacture product in the safety business, but our large scale assets uh, are in the US. Our largest facility is actually just down the road from you in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and we continue to find ways to invest locally um, uh, in a company that's constrained on many different fronts. You know, we're all constrained, you know, we've had to be creative. So we uh, more recently with some of the recent investments we're putting in now, uh, done that in concert with partnerships, uh, whether it's with the US government or, or other entities. Uh, but ultimately, you know, having US-based manufacturing is critical for our business. Uh, but we also need to balance the demands of what our customers are asking for and the competitive nature of product uh, that we compete against. And uh, as a result, we have there are instances where we will make product here. Uh, they tend to be much higher value in use uh, uh, in use products uh, and where we need to be much more cost competitive. We need to spread the manufacturing to different parts of the globe. Okay. Maybe as a follow on from that there, and I, you know, one of the groups, I'll, I'll kind of add to this a little bit as a little bit of context. One of the groups asked uh, how successful you were in navigating the restrictions or market manipulation that were placed on, on the company when you were trying to move more products around the world. And just in context of that, you know, the, our last session, we actually looked at supply chains. One of the things we looked at was supply chains from a national security point of view. And that, uh, adversaries uh, manipulate our supply chains uh, potentially to, you know, to our costs. So for a company like a uh, DuPont, uh, Dow, you're, you're, you're embedded in a number of these countries in the world, including countries that, that we might, you know, consider adversaries. How do you, how do you, how do you balance that? How do you, how do you steer that, that course? Well, it, it, I mean, it's an ever-changing set of circumstances. You know, we have to be on top of, you know, the prevailing winds at any point in time. You know, this is the benefit of having a large, diverse uh, company uh, as well as a set of assets. So, you know, we have a large-scale facility in the U.S. We have another one in Europe uh, that allows us to the extent that there are, you know, situations we need to navigate, we can do so from different continents. Um, you know, specific to the, the, maybe the question was also aimed at the pandemic response, you know, specific to how we responded to that, you know, I, I got to tell you as a business leader, one thing I've learned over the years, full and complete transparency, whether it's internal, you know, or needed externally is the right course. And back in uh, early March timeframe, I distinctly remember having uh, you know, the first call that we received from the White House, and then the immediate call I had with my organization, my leadership team, and I said, you know, we're going to be very transparent with the principles we're putting in place on how product is being allocated across segments and regions, um, and we're going to be very clear on documenting all of the decision tree from day one. So that, you know, as questions arise, you know, we can feel very comfortable, sleep well at night. And so specific to our set of circumstances, we have a stated principle in the company um, and we've adhered to that very ardently this year that there is no profiteering. In fact, you know, there were no change in price to products that are going into the pandemic response. And we went one step further and put notices out to all of our customers direct and downstream in our value chains that we were going to make sure that our principles, our core values would be followed. So we were not going to dictate their price, but certainly if we saw a situation where a partner of ours was acting out of bounds and was going to cause you know, irreparable harm to our brand and our business, we were going to make sure that we took the appropriate actions. So you know, from my, from my standpoint, although it's been a challenging nine months, I sleep very well at night knowing, you know, we've done this in a very principled way to get the most product out to every corner of the world as quickly as possible. And another uh, question that's 
come up, and I've got a, a you know a, a number of questions here about the you know the post-COVID world as well. You know, coming up here. So I mean, how the first one really from one of the groups is how lightly is Dupont going to you know going back? Is it to the normal way of business that was happening pre-COVID? I mean, what what will go back and what do you think is going to stay the same, you know, as uh, you know, in your in this in this environment? You, you, so DuPont's been go undergoing um, an evolution since I joined, but certainly the last uh, five years have been the most dramatic. And I'll add in a positive way. But for perspective, this is how much change we're going through, and I can give you a flavor for what what might stick here going forward. But in the the Great Recession, ten years ago, twelve years ago. We lost, uh, you know, let's say our revenue declined on the order of about 19, 20% in that period. And our EBITDA dropped by half. Just a terrible situation. Fast forward to this year and all the disruption, you know, we're primarily an industrials based business with heavy exposure to automotive and many of these other markets. We're, we're probably going to drop on the order of, 7% on uh, revenue and earnings are only going to decline by a comparable amount. You know, it's a real testament to the amount of change that we've been able to put into the system. We've adapted very quickly to working remotely. We had a little bit of an indicator with China. In fact, we had a hiccup in January because our systems were not ready for the onslaught, but we learned quickly. And by February, March, um, the organization adapted well, Murray. I mean, we typically were a teleconference organization, not a video conference. We've had zero disruption with video conferencing capability. It's how we operate today. I think it's here to stay. Um, and we've extended to the extent that, you know, when we go back to traveling, there'll be more of a blended approach. But I will say that we've actually changed our thinking about how we engage downstream in the markets now. I do think the days of large trade shows, you know, where the frequency of trade shows we are participating in aren't going to happen. We're engaging digitally to down, downstream to create demand. It won't be a complete substitute for face-to-face, -face, but I wouldn't be surprised if more than half of how we engage in creating demand is digitally based going forward. And that's a big boon to our cost structure and our nimbleness, uh, frankly. And so I think you told me at one time when you're your plant in, in Richmond uh, operated with with uh, almost a, a quarter of the staff uh, and how was the productivity there? Well, you know, it's it's like anything. You can cut out travel or you can cut out entertainment or you can cut out R&D or you can cut down on the number of people that go through the turnstile at the plant. You know, it has short term gains. The, the trick is adding back at the right rate and in the right areas. And so you have the, the example he was alluding to pre-pandemic, pre you know, probably 2,100 people will go through the turnstile, a mix of professionals and operations and maintenance and contractors. And you know, today, maybe 400 go through the turnstile. It allows us to keep all of our lines running. And surprisingly, you know, they run better. And so, there's a little bit of a learning in there that we've got to dig deeper into because, you know, when everyone is on site, one of the ways you create value is make change. And when you make change, it causes instability and instability that's uncontrolled causes, you know, downside effects. So in fact, our yields are uptime. Uh, our productivity at the site is, is uh, beyond what it ever had been historically. So we're going to have to figure out how we lock that in and then add back the resources as appropriate going forward. Because it can't be forever in this format, but we know it doesn't necessarily need to go back to 2100. And I had two questions from faculty before we started. I wanted, and this is about the post-COVID world. Um, yeah. And one was the extent to which new manufacturing technologies or and in fact, new technologies in general will affect your business. You know, we're either in the manufacturing itself or, you know, they were looking at the fact that you're a materials business, you know, so, you know, the extent to which, you know, things will be embedded into your materials, how that affects your, how you see that, that world of, you know, of manufacturing 4.0 uh, 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 
develop and how that affects your your particular set of businesses? Yeah, so surprisingly, I mean, um, specialty material type businesses aren't necessarily perceived as being on the forefront of innovation. Uh, but there is still some either basic chemistry or fundamental new science that can be brought to bear and brought to market. Uh, but you need to honestly earn the right to be able to do that. And that really was where the heavy lifting in 2017 and 18 was to reestablish financial credibility and health and demonstrate we had strategies for growth that then fueled investment in new technology. And so we're bearing that benefit now, starting this year and next year, we're bringing new technology to the world that will be you know, a complete fundamental step above where we were with our current core products. We're also investing heavily in the technology to modernize our assets. And so yes, digital 4.0, whether it's automation of the you know, automation of activities at the plant level or automating the equipment so we can capture data to then gather new insights. Um, we're doing a lot in a 50 year old business we're doing a lot today that would be unheard of five years ago with, you know, either it's cloud computing, use all the buzzwords, right? Machine learning and artificial intelligence. And that's very active in how we not only predict demand, but also how we task our assets down to the minute and how we optimize our supply chains around the world. And the other question, I'm going to extrapolate it slightly, but, uh, you, you know, you're a... Uh, and my understanding is that the, the feedstock for your product is uh, is based on a set of chemistry, but it, it's essentially, you know, it's based on the carbon molecule, you know, uh, and cracking that carbon molecule. So it, uh, so the question was, you know, environmental concerns and how you know different issues around the you know pressures uh, on the environment from investors and other including investors and other stakeholder groups, how you see that affecting, you know, the, your business in this post COVID world? Yeah. So sustainability as a theme is, uh, is not only rising, but it's essential. I mean, and you see it in the business world, when you look at some of the private equity companies and investment groups, uh, raising the social conscious around sustainability. I'm very proud of this company in terms of the goals that we've set out for ourselves over the next 10 years. We have published 2030 sustainability goals and going out farther beyond that. Um, you know, it's around innovation with our people and with our processes and in the environment. Um, I think it's, I, I fundamentally believe it's here to stay. I think it will continue to reshape some of the competitive landscapes that we operate in. Um, and for the businesses that, uh, that comprise DuPont Safety, we have a significant amount of work to do, but also opportunity in front of us. Um, and we're going down that path now. And <clears throat> unlike five years ago or 10 years ago, where it was very hard to build a, a, you know, a rational business case uh, on its merits, it's becoming much easier now. It's, it really helps when there is a market pull uh, to set expectations. Uh, to drive change, you know, positive change in, in business as well as in the economy. And so here's my my last question. We're gonna kind of finish off a now, but you know, we we you know there if you're if you're looking at students and this is something that's very interesting for faculty, I mean, what do you see as the critical skills that you know I mean, make us you know kind of very concrete that the skills that you're really looking for in your businesses and you think are going to propel your businesses going forward. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so uh, great, great question, Murray. And I, if I could expand it beyond skills and I'll explain why. Um, the, the simple fact of the matter is as a country and as a, you know, a global economy, you know, people are getting smarter and smarter. It may be counterintuitive when you watch TV every day, but the number of educated people in the world is only increasing. And so skills, the critical skills in whatever pursuit you go after, you know, are, are essential to, to, they're the foundation. But ultimately, the differentiation comes in in a variety of other ways. And so, uh, like I started with, I'm blessed in that the organization I work with you know, they're high performing and they, they challenge and raise me up every single day. And I wouldn't want to be in an organization in, in any different way. 
you play better when you're surrounded by better people. But the one uh, thing that I have realized over the years is as a, as a leader uh, and as an individual, you have to really figure out what's the set of circumstances that resonate the most with you. Ultimately, boil it down to the word passion. You know, what industry, what role, what type of activities do you do where you know you create value, but at the same time, you're so passionate about it, it's enjoyable. Because if you think about it, you're going to spend probably more time in your career than anything else in life. And you're going to be, I mean, deeply invested in it with the people you work with. And so the takeaway here is certainly over the last five to 10 years, I've come to the conclusion, you know, it's very easy to get similarly qualified candidates. One of the big differentiators is how passionate are they about what they do? And so in our defense space, most of the people, it's not, you know, leaning towards groupthink. They're a diverse group, but ultimately, I want those people to be passionate about, you know, defense and protection and understanding of current affairs and military aerospace. I want a bunch of ex-pilots, whether they're military or commercial, in addition to being engineers. In our automotive segment, I want that individual to be so passionate about racing and cars and the industry that they don't need to be taught that. They live and breathe it every single day. And when those, those, those things come together, you end up never working a day in your life, but enjoying it. You know, it'll be ups and downs, but you, you enjoy it a lot in, in the process. John, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate this. We're coming to the end. We give a digital uh, clap, you know, there. It's, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. John, Welcome. Murray, can I ask one little question? Uh, yes. It must be a little because we're, we're just about, some people yeah. are going to clap. Right. Uh, if Heather McMahon was here, who sits on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, in the technology end of things, she's deeply concerned about and working on um, the supply chain issue. Um, are, are you working within that group? Are you, are you familiar with who I'm talking about in the, in the issue? Because I'd happily connect you. That'd be great to connect. I'm familiar with the group, and it is certainly a an area of concern. Yeah, well, ping me and I'll send you a little intro. She's a pal of mine. She spoke here a couple of weeks ago. So. Great. Well, thank you very much, Philip. Yep. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. I want to thank everybody for coming and uh, and just remind you next week, uh, this that will be a, next week is going to be a fact our last guest session for for this semester. Jonathan Hess, uh, who's a uh, executive vice president at Whiting Turner as a member of our board as well. He's, he's gonna be talking, he's, he's actually there's some nice follow-ons from Heather's talk two weeks ago and today, and because I, I would imagine Viking Turner is a large uh, construction contractor or a uh, uh, customers of the, uh, as well, so for, for John. So, and he's gonna be talking about a variety of things, but including how supply chains are fundamentally changing in construction industries and how that changes the way construction industries are going to work in the future. So, so that's uh, that's next week. Uh, uh, we will continue with Tuesdays. You know, I'm going to have some themes discussions, uh, but no guests. You know, for the rest of the semester. And feeling that uh, some of you may be getting zoomed out, but it's a uh, and uh, but we we'll still continue to to meet as a community on Tuesday. December 15th, so uh, everybody here will get a, uh, just remind you, we'll get an invite. Uh, we're going to have at noon, we're going to have a special uh, event, it's a launch of Management and Business Review, which is a new journal that a University of Baltimore, along with a, uh, we, we are launching our own with 11 other business schools. Uh, it's edited by one of our professors, Cal Single plus uh, uh, professors from Michigan and Wharton. We're going to launch that and describe that. You'll all be getting some publicity about that. It's, uh, I think it's emblematic of what the Merrick School stands for in terms of connecting you know, scholars and good business thinking with real practice and real, real problems like we've been talking about talking about today. And, and then we will resume these sessions uh, with a guest. The first guest is not going to be for February, beginning of semester. That will be uh, Jonathan Roberts, who's a um, uh, partner, one of the founding partners of Ignition Partners in uh, Seattle. They're in Seattle Mental Park, uh, and uh, 